Hello, thanks for watching the September 6th Wednesday evening West Weather Update brought to you by Nutrinag Solutions. If you go back to Wednesday of last week, one possibility we talked about was the Pacific Northwest finally getting some rainfall over that kind of seven day forecast, kind of leading us out to now here Wednesday, September 6th. Well, I have pulled up here, this is the last seven days of precipitation valid as of this morning here. And if we hone in here on the Willamette Valley, uh, we finally see that we did get some significant measurable pre pre precipitation into the Willamette Valley. Uh, that's good news for some of the soils there that were drying out. We saw some big soil moisture deficits there uh, that we looked at earlier this summer. Uh, as much as an inch, even a little bit more in the upper Willamette or the lower Willamette Valley, I should say, further toward the north uh, near the confluence of the Columbia, uh, further up the valley or toward the south, uh, lower amounts, but still, still what I would call significant precip, half an inch uh, to an inch of rainfall near Salem, Oregon. Uh, that was kind of the drier area, if anywhere, in the Pacific Northwest in terms of that drought. So good news, uh, again, for some of the soils there. We also discussed last week that as that low pressure system responsible for the rainfall in the Pacific Northwest made its way into the interior west, it would catch or at least pull up this sort of subtropical upper level low, which had quite a bit of tropical moisture associated with it, into the southwest and then into the interior west, potentially sparking an active monsoon over this past weekend. Uh, I will say that was even more active or strong in terms of rainfall than I expected or at least initially forecasted last Wednesday. Some of the rainfall amounts, uh, they're shown here. Here's our color bar down here. An inch of rain is when we get into that yellow. Uh, as you get up into that kind of dark red, even that kind of gray color, getting up toward four inches plus saw quite a bit of rainfall here across the middle and lower Colorado River Valley. Parts of far uh, southeastern California actually got more rain this weekend out of this kind of subtropical low, didn't have a name associated with it like the remnants of Hillary. They got more rainfall uh, than that Hillary remnants that came through in the middle of August. I'm talking one, two to even three inches of rainfall for parts of the desert southwest. Las Vegas, I think, saw something like two and a half inches of rain out of this event in a very short period of time. There was a festival in northern Nevada. Uh, festival goers, they're stranded uh, essentially on a dried out lake bed that had about an inch of rainfall in it in a short amount of time. So a lot of impacts from this flooding. We saw flash flood warnings this weekend over Labor Day weekend in far southeast California, even into the, some of the transverse ranges here. So, uh, you know, this event... I, a little bit stronger than we expected. Hillary, I think for some of the folks in the lower Colorado, rather River Valley, was a bit more uh, biased to the West when all things were said and done. If anything, this event uh, was more biased to those folks who may, might have uh, missed out. So either way you cut it, it's been a busy water year uh, for folks in the Southwest. Uh, zooming in, looking a little bit closer here, this is Blythe, California, a little bit up the Colorado River Valley. Uh, technically uh, running a deficit earlier this summer, but thanks to Hillary down here and the much stronger rainfall that came in this past weekend, uh, we went from a deficit in late summer in terms of that annual rainfall uh, average, which is this, this smoother black line here, where now we're running an above average amount for rainfall uh, just a few days later after the remnants of that tropical system came through here. Now, Blythe, California, not the rainiest place in the country. In fact, uh, one of the least rainiest places. Uh, so it doesn't take a, a few big events here to get them well above average, but nonetheless kind of neat to see how quickly uh, they can go from below average to above average. Uh, unfortunately, what's not neat is some of these desert locations like we saw you know, at the festival uh, in Nevada or Las Vegas, just not built for that amount of rain uh, in a short amount of time. And you saw issues in flooding uh, as a result of that. Did mention the upper Willamette Valley that was dealing with some of the dry soils there. Uh, they're still running that deficit here this summer. We've talked about the drought building into the Pacific Northwest. I think that's likely to remain an issue going forward, at least looking at the forecast that we'll get into later. Um, but we did get this, again, significant precipitation amount approaching toward an inch of rainfall in parts of the upper Willamette Valley and put a little bit of a dent in this deficit that we were running this summer uh, below that normal accrual of rainfall here uh, in Oregon. Uh, but nonetheless, not bad news uh, for some soils there that were drying out pretty quickly. If you look at those soil moisture percentiles for Western Oregon, Western Washington, uh, this area was essentially off the color bar uh, dry, below that 2% percentile here in the Pacific Northwest. About a week later here now, September 6th, as of this morning, still some dry areas here, certainly in the upper Willamette and Western Washington, but not quite as dry as we saw uh, going into the end of August here as a result of some of this recent uh, precipitation. 
And then finally wanted to cover Las Vegas. Uh, like I said, they saw anywhere from two to three inches uh, across the county there. Uh, now well above average on the year here. They definitely went through that after Hillary and now this recent system that came through. And not only is it obviously a desert in Southern Nevada, but you also have a lot of streets and concrete that's not good for rainfall runoff. Uh, looking at pictures across Las Vegas this weekend, we saw a lot of urban flooding. This is Interstate 15 outside of town. Uh, this is actually uh, the southbound lane of I-15 here. Looks more like a river on this map. The uh, northbound lane here with all the cars in it, uh, hard to see because of the kind of blurry image here, but that's all standing water underneath those tires here. So some of these drivers are lucky that uh, this wasn't flowing a little bit faster. These could even have washed out the road uh, and taken some of these cars with it. Uh, just a ton of rainfall coming in the desert this year uh, from Hillary and then the system that came through this weekend. Uh, unfortunately, we kind of talked about the possibility of this. It's August, it's September. That's kind of the peak, uh, at least two of the peak months for hurricane activity. That's true over in the Atlantic, still watching storms there. True in the Eastern Pacific and even more true in an El Nino year where we have these warm ocean temperatures that these hurricanes thrive on. So we're still watching a hurricane here in the Eastern Pacific. This was newly named uh, Hurricane Hova here, J-O-V-A, in the Eastern Pacific from this bird's eye view, clearly a powerful storm. You have these spiral bandings wrapping around the storm, the strong kind of dense uh, eye wall thunderstorm activity in the middle of it. Often, you know, this past summer when we were looking at some of these storms develop, had this disheveled appearance, slowly organizing a circulation. Uh, no question what's going on here. This is a quickly uh, strengthening, powerful hurricane here in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, definitely bears watching going forward. Uh, I think the good news right now, just to kind of spoil it, is this is not expected right now in its forecast track to impact land, uh, not directly at least, not the western U.S. Uh, or Hawaii right now, but we will take kind of a closer look at it here. Uh, if anything, just because it's a very uh, strong uh, storm, these satellite imagery are cool to look at. Uh, this is what we call, I'll show you here, this kind of perfect circle of thunderstorms. We call this the CDO, or Central Dense Overcast. And when you see how kind of almost perfect circular shape to it. You can see how quickly it's wrapping around that pinhole eye. A hint to us that this is a very powerful hurricane, likely intensifying. Uh, that's the expectation from the National Hurricane Center. Uh, I'll say currently a Category 2 hurricane, but even in those last few frames, you saw it develop that pinhole eye in those last kind of few frames there. Uh, the thunderstorm tops getting even colder. Uh, I expect this is probably nearing, if not already, a Category 3 hurricane in the Pacific here and likely making a run at a stronger one than that. Forecast from the National Hurricane Center, expecting this to move toward the Northwest, get up into Category 4 strength status. Um, you know, based on current visuals, probably a remote possibility it tries to go toward Category 5. This is a very mean hurricane, uh, albeit somewhat small. And curiously, this kind of CDO or the central distance overcast, not very big. Uh, similar to Dora, now I kind of want to end the similarities there because not expecting the same kind of long march south of Hawaii that we saw from Dora. I'm just kind of curious that both these strong hurricanes here in the eastern Pacific exhibiting that small but powerful eye wall thunderstorm shape to them. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, cool to see this, especially when it's not, you know, an immediate threat to life, uh, land, or property here. National Hurricane Center going forward, this M here stands for major hurricane, so we would expect this next update here, just based on the visual you saw earlier, uh, based on the forecast we see here from the National Hurricane Center, that this will very soon, if not already, be a Category 3 strength storm, exiting off toward the west-northwest. I say exiting because away from the Mexican coastline, away from the western U.S., expected to weaken likely in the eastern Pacific here further toward the north as it gets into some of this colder water that we've been keeping track of all year long on this line extending from Cabo toward the southwest. Uh, that's good news, uh, like I said, for the western U.S., good news for Hawaii uh, that the expectation, the forecast here, it's likely to weaken sometime early next week, uh, well in between, you know, California uh, and Hawaii. Can't rule out that it makes a turn after weakening toward Hawaii here, uh, ends up impacting the islands as this kind of uh, ghostly, uh, gusty winds, some increased rainfall, but not right now, not expecting much of that uh, going forward in terms of impactful weather. One impact uh, I think that hurricane could have, and we watch El Nino for this reason, is that the thunderstorms, the hurricanes, the typhoons that uh, might develop as a result of El Nino can impact uh, the jet stream. And I think we see a little bit of that. We're looking at the ECMWF jet stream forecast here. Uh, I'll make this valid here. This is Wednesday afternoon. Uh, hurricane Hove is actually off the screen to the south here. So it's way down here. You can kind of see some uh, reflection of that in the upper level height field here. 
This is the jet stream, Howie. This is the uh, subtropical jet stream we talked about last week. As I take this forecast into Thursday, into Friday, there's that quickly strengthening Hurricane Hova here into Category 4, even beyond potentially. You don't see much of a reflection here at that jet stream level height from the ECMWF. Hurricanes, tropical storms are very much kind of a low, uh, mid-level atmospheric phenomenon, and we just see this kind of reflection of them in the upper levels as this outward moving or exhausting uh, ridge in the upper levels of the atmosphere here. And we watch these ridges uh, because they're really pushing off a lot of heat. We call these kind of exhaust or the outflow from these hurricanes. And those can strengthen the jet stream uh, at times in these kind of gradients uh, between the outflow from these storms and the jet stream to the north. And we actually see that going into Friday here, September 8th, and then Saturday, September 9th, the upper level ridge associated with the storm positioned somewhere over the far southwestern US, this strong jet stream coming into California and Nevada. Yeah. So potentially as a result of Hurricane Hova, seeing a strengthening upper level ridge over the southwest likely bringing temperatures up going into this weekend and strengthening that jet stream coming on shore over California, Nevada, Utah. We expect that to, you know, usually when we talk about a strengthened subtropical jet stream blowing over this area as weakening that monsoonal circulation. So expecting more heat this weekend and potential pause in some of that monsoonal activity we saw uh, perhaps last weekend. So that's a forecast right now going forward with that confidence in Hurricane Hova strengthening here. It's certainly looking at the satellite imagery. Uh, that seems to be consistent with what we're seeing in the real time. If we jump over and look at forecast high temperatures from the National Weather Service, this is from the NDFD, uh, their product here. Uh, today, not seeing too extreme uh, temperatures here in the desert southwest, but as I take this through Thursday, September 7th, the forecast high is there, increasing into Friday, and then finally into Saturday, September 9th, talking 109, 108, 111, uh, depending on where exactly you are in the lower Colorado River Valley and central in western Arizona. Temperatures coming up in the San Joaquin Valley as well into the mid-90s, uh, potentially above 90s as well in the Sacramento Valley. Lower temperatures toward the north in the Pacific Northwest. As I take this forecast into Sunday, temperatures coming up a bit in the Sacramento Valley into Monday as well, but finally moderating some in the desert southwest as we get into Tuesday of next week. We might see mid next week some more rainfall or monsoonal activity trying to get back into the upper elevations of the southwest here. If I look at the ECMWF seven-day precipitation anomalies over that next seven-day period, so really starting today all the way out through next, uh, or at least the beginning of next Wednesday, as a result of that kind of enhanced flow coming around that upper level ridge associated with HOVA, not expecting a ton of monsoonal precipitation. Uh, what I can't rule out is potentially some of this upper level moisture getting pushed up into the atmosphere from HOVA, trying to sneak a shower or two into the coastal mountains of California here, kind of coincident with where that jet stream's coming on shore, or potentially in the foothills or the crest of uh, the Sierra Nevada here, but unlikely to be a rainfall maker for the Central Valley proper or some of the low-lying areas here in California. Another area we're seeing devoid of precip in that seven-day forecast is the Pacific Northwest. So. Well, we did see some rainfall come through the past seven days, seeing a shift back toward drier conditions here in that seven day forecast. Uh, we didn't talk about it much when I was showing you that jet stream earlier, but even here, just taking you back to September 9th here, uh, out on the uh, Saturday forecast, there's that jet stream coming on shore, that subtropical component into California that we talked about. But if you look toward the north of that, the polar component of the jet stream, that more northerly component that typically drives precipitation into the Pacific Northwest, we have a trough here over the Gulf of Alaska, but then this big ridge here over British Columbia in Washington. That is gonna keep a little bit warmer temperatures lingering around, uh, but really the main feature there is a lack of precipitation expected in this area as a result of that jet stream formation there. And I'll make that color a little bit more visible here uh, on the map here. So with this kind of regime here, less precipitation, a little bit more warmth in the Pacific Northwest, more subtropical jet stream activity toward the south. That actually sounds kind of a bit uh, like what we're expecting this winter, uh, where you know we typically get more precipitation along this kind of southerly region of the desert southwest, parts of the western US, California. We typically get warmer and drier conditions in the Pacific Northwest. Now it's not winter, so we're not seeing that kind of exact same effect from that, that subtropical jet stream not delivering as much precipitation into California, seeing as it's kind of late summer, early September here. But if the same kind of regime sticks around, that's actually what kind of your 
textbook El Nino pattern is likely to deliver in a winter uh, time period. So it's interesting to see that as early as September here. Now, I'm not saying it's going to last the same pattern from you know, September 6th and 7th all the way out to December 15th. We're going to see changes, uh, you know, shifts in between that on the weekly to monthly time scale. Uh, but it is kind of a hint that that El Nino circulation, that kind of global effect of El Nino is perhaps starting to increase here in the recent weeks. If we jump over and look, this is looking down at the northern hemisphere. So to kind of orient ourselves here, here is the United States, the continental United States, Hawaii over here, North America, uh, within that area there. And what I meant by kind of seeing an El Nino circulation develop, if I take this GFS ensemble forecast from that same jet stream we were looking at, and I'm going to make this valid out into next week. I'll just take it all the way at the time of recording this video, all the way out into next week at September 13th. And this is kind of what I was talking about. You see the subtropical jet stream coming out of Hawaii in towards Southern California. There's that kind of Hilo Hawaii uh, to Los Angeles connection that we've talked about. And then the polar component of that jet stream trough over Alaska and then trying to ridge out here somewhere over the Pacific Northwest, perhaps parts of Alberta. This pattern, you know, in September, not likely to deliver a ton of precipitation uh, to California or the desert Southwest. Um, but if it lasts or it lingers into this winter, when there's better atmospheric connections toward that kind of uh, Pineapple Express, we would expect higher rainfall amounts in parts of California, Nevada, and Arizona out of this, and perhaps some drier and warmer conditions in the Pacific Northwest. So just kind of interesting to see this pattern developing here in mid to late September and the effects that might have kind of long term as we look into the fall and winter forecast in just a few slides here. Looking at the immediate uh, forecast here out into next week, the 6 to 10 day outlook from the Climate Prediction Center. I'll make this a little bit bigger uh, and more visible for you all here. The 6 to 10 day outlook, there's kind of the reflection of that El Nino pattern I was just talking about. Warmer for parts of the Pacific Northwest, drier for that same area with the jet stream extending up into Canada and that El Nino pattern. As a result of that jet stream kind of pushing on shore over California, Arizona, and Nevada, looking out into the work week uh, next week, at least over the next few days, expecting a weakening of that monsoon with the strengthened uh, component of that subtropical jet stream as a result of HOVA strengthening over here in the Pacific. But we do see a little bit of a weakening in that subtropical jet stream getting out into what I'll call you know Tuesday of next week, Wednesday of next week, uh, Thursday. I'll try to show that to you really quickly just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So here's Saturday, very strong with uh, HOVA over here in the Eastern Pacific. But if I take this forecast into Tuesday, and now into Wednesday, see a bit of weakening in the subtropical jet stream. Even by Wednesday night, uh, we see it trying to open up into a more southerly or southwestern flow regime here. And what I mean by that is the winds coming more out of the due southwest, blowing up into a little bit of a ridge here over the desert southwest that could open up the chances uh, for that monsoon to return to this area here in the upper elevations of Arizona, parts of Nevada, Utah, and New Mexico. I think that's what we're seeing from the Climate Prediction Center here with the increased rainfall probabilities in parts of uh, northeast Arizona, far southeast Nevada, Utah, parts of New Mexico. Not expecting extreme warmth uh, really next week out of this pattern. Uh, not the highest values we've seen in parts of the Pacific Northwest, but given that it's dry, likely exacerbating the drought issues here despite some of the recent rain. And then finally, I uh, did want to touch on El Nino. So we've been tracking this all summer as El Nino has been strengthening. It's been strengthening slowly, um, but it's starting to kind of add up a little bit here. So uh, here's where we are now as the latest uh, update on September 6th. Uh, El Nino, again, uh, if we take you all the way back here to June 28th, just the slow march of strengthening here uh, getting into September. The forecast is that's going to continue, and we'll go from right now, which is a weak to moderate El Nino, to potentially a strong or very strong El Nino getting out into December or January of the 23-24 water year. There are some kind of caveats to that strong or very strong El Nino conversation. Uh, just because it's going to be strong or very strong does not mean it's even you know, more likely to be a textbook El Nino. Uh, we saw that kind of in the 2015 uh, El Nino, that just because it was a very strong one didn't necessarily mean we saw this kind of inundation of California and Arizona rainfall. Uh, but nonetheless, that circulation is getting stronger. We're seeing that El Nino develop a little bit more. Even just looking at the sea surface temperature anomaly map, uh, valid here as of yesterday, El Nino becoming more of a dominant signature on this map. The warm waters here extending off uh, the coast of Peru into the central Pacific here. Despite that, we do see a lot of anomalous, anomalous warmth in the northern oceans. And what I mean by that is this warmth here we can see north of Hawaii, the warmth here in the northwest Pacific, and then the warmth in the nor north Atlantic. Despite El Nino strengthening, if we get into this winter and we still see a lot of this warmth here, that could potentially shake the pattern out of what may be 
maybe a more textbook El Nino into something else. Now, what that something else is right now is not clear. Uh, all I can say is it would decrease the certainty of that textbook El Nino pattern going forward. Um, that's why at times I've called for maybe a more normal, perhaps above normal water year for California. I'm not totally convinced right now. It's just going to be this uh, huge, uh, another very wet spring, very snowy spring for California as we get into next year. We're just going to have to kind of wait and see how this ocean temperature picture shapes out as we get into fall and winter. Uh, I will say that some of these northerly anomalies can be quick to revert back to normal temperatures, maybe even cooler water more quickly than say the Central Pacific will. So we'll have to keep an eye on these closely as we go kind of month to month into winter, um, but too early to have much confidence in that long range forecast. And as I say that, I'm gonna turn around and just show you uh, one of these long range forecasts here. Uh, and we'll just talk through it. I'll give you a sense of uh, what I'm thinking and what this forecast shows here. This is the latest ECMWF uh, seasonal precipitation forecast going forward. Uh, right now, the valid months here for this forecast are September, October, November of 2023, looking at precipitation anomalies. So the green is where we're expecting more precipitation, the brown we're expecting precipitation deficits. If we go through September, October, and November here, we see some weakness here uh, and potentially the end of the monsoon here. We've talked about the connection there with El Nino uh, at times. Some of the precipitation here you see in parts of Nevada, uh, far southeastern California, likely a result of this forecast initialized on September 1st, picking up on some of that moisture that came through just this past weekend. So some of this might already even be baked into this forecast here, given how little rain falls here uh, in a typical year anyway. But as I take this forecast to October, November, December, we see some dryness lingering in the Pacific Northwest, actually extending down into the northern, even central parts of California. We know that at least in California, that water year really kicks into gear, kind of getting into January, February, and March of the next year. Uh, so I don't think that's a, a huge concern in terms of getting a more normal water year in the central or northern Sierras. As I take this forecast, you'll see why I said that into November, December, January. Finally, we see more of a more textbook El Nino pattern here with that onshore flow from the subtropical jet stream starting to deliver more precipitation to the coastal areas of California here, getting into November, December, and then just into the new year, into January here with again, kind of a double down of that dryness expected in the Pacific Northwest. If I take this forecast further out, December, January, and February, just kind of an increase in both those two signals, wetter in parts of California, wetter perhaps near Las Vegas, and parts of Arizona as well. And then even getting further out into January, February, and March, more of the same, that kind of textbook El Nino pattern, subtropical jet stream coming through, that jet stream well up into British Columbia and Alberta, similar with what I just showed you for that forecast of next week, leaving the Pacific Northwest drier and warmer. I will say looking at some of these long range forecasts here, I see more agreement or more consistency that this Pacific Northwest uh, forecast has more confidence to it. Uh, it's not a home run. There's no home runs in long range forecasting. It's very much an inexact science. But right now I have higher confidence that the Pacific Northwest stays drier this winter versus the fact that maybe California has a wetter than normal water year. My thinking for California is that we're expecting a normal uh, water year to potentially above normal. Uh, the expectation for the Pacific Northwest is that it's gonna be drier than normal right now, uh, at least for me. Again, too early to talk specifics. We'll have to keep an eye on those ocean temperatures uh, going forward. The warmth in the Northern Pacific could kind of throw a wrench into things here, but at least wanted to show you this forecast here to show you that kind of textbook El Nino forecast is at least still in the cards of the ECMWF long range models to be believed. And we'll keep an eye on that as we get closer to the fall and winter. That's all I have for you all this evening. Thank you for watching.